go to Children's Church. My microphone works because it's now plugged in the way it should be. When I take it apart at the end of Sunday, I unhook it, wrap it up, and then I, it's my fault. I didn't plug it in right. So, not the guys in the back. I just don't want to, and it's not the system's fault. It's human error. My error. So, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we uh, are going to turn to your word now. And uh, probably never been a time in my life when I've appreciated the privilege of opening your word more than, than this moment. We've just sung a song about surrendering. We apply that song we've just sung to this moment and tell you that we submit ourselves to the authority of your word. Bless us, give us seeking hearts, willing hearts, understanding hearts. God, I pray for myself that you would help me. It's, warm, it's a sticky and a humid and a somewhat uncomfortable. Uh, in our imagination remember the uh, Christians in Siberia that, that met out in the forest because they had no place to meet in shivering temperatures so the Africans that we met uh, Dorothy and I that, that uh, 110, 120 degrees uh, having church so this is uh, not any worse than many of your people have experienced. We uh, apply ourselves and focus on what you want to say to us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listening to some of the songs that uh, were chosen for this Sunday, and a lot of them have to do with submission and uh, following the lead of, of Christ. It occurred to me while I was sitting there preparing my heart to stand before you that, that the message this morning taps into what may be the biggest human problem that goes all the way back to the beginning, and that is that we don't want a leader. Eve and Adam, right in the very beginning, in the end, did not want a leader. They wanted to lead. And so, this morning's message is uh, just a look at how the whole question of church leadership unfolded. This is a, the first of three messages on this, on this topic. Sounds kind of boring, but I'm thinking that by the time we're done, you won't think so. I'm hoping anyway. Within the Trinity, let's get uh, grab a hold of the big picture a moment. Within the Trinity, we have the Father and the Son and the Spirit. The Father is the head, the leader in that organization, and the Son follows the leadership of his Father. The Father's responsibility is to love the Son and care for the Son, and the Son honors the Father. There's lots of verses I could pull up to uh, talk about this. John is just ripe with them. Uh, how Jesus uh, talks about how he follows the leadership of his Father all the time. So this pattern of leadership and followership is echoed in, in the three institutions that God has uh, graced the world with, civilization with. And uh, these institutions help provide structure for people as we live together. And so again, institution, that doesn't sound very uh, fun on a Sunday morning, but the three institutions are pretty basic to our life, and they're, they're family, and church, and civil government. And so in each, each one of these three, there is a leader, 
sort of set up whether he's the king or the governor or whatever and in the, the home it's the father and so on and in each one of these institutions then under the head there are the followers and so what I want us to see this morning is that this pattern that is echoed in the three institutions really starts in the Trinity that there is a headship and a followership set up even before creation and that this is sort of echoed in the institutions that God has has uh, given us so in the Bible each of the in these separate institutions the leaders are charged with the responsibility of leading in the best interest of the ones who are under their care so if it's a husband the husband has said I'm God says I'm going to give you authority and responsibility make your choices in your leadership capacity that are in the best interest of the ones who are under your authority and it's the same for government and it's the same for church the followers in each one of these three institutions are instructed to honor and pray for their leaders and submit to their authority and again I could show you verses that say that in each one of these three institute in uh, instances so we've learned a lot in the last uh, month or so about how this works in families from the last half of Colossians chapter 3 and if you've missed some of those messages I, I just I learned a whole lot and I hope that you did too what I'd like to do for the next couple of weeks is examine how this works in a different institution instead of family we want to look at how this operates in the church so let's make this observation this morning one of the complaints that people make about Christianity is that Jesus is kind of an okay guy but the church stinks they like Jesus they just don't like the church and they see the church as sort of a corrupt organization a power hungry outfit and I just to be fair to the critics of the church there is a lot of reason for people to think so throughout history there are many examples of the church being more about money and power than really advancing God's purposes so we won't go into all the examples this morning, but we could pull a lot of examples out. And there's things going on in the news today that still continue to make us think that the church is more about money and power than it is about anything else. So, and there's many places today where the church has power, but the spirit of Christ is absent. So I acknowledge that. But some of the distrust of the church has also come about because of people's cynicism about organized anything. Ever since the days of the Watergate scandal and the Vietnam War and the pervasive misuse of power wherever we look today, not only politics but in, in the media and in local government and, and everywhere you look and in many churches admittedly has led people to just distrust authority wherever they see it in school or wherever I don't trust the leaders of course that's you know that's kind of human nature because way back in Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden Eve ended up making the choices that she did because she didn't trust God's leadership so it's sort of hardwired into us not to want to trust those in authority so the trouble with being a leader today, and I'm, this is sort of autobiographical, is that often you can't tell whether people are following you or chasing you. Someone wrote, I think with a, a great deal of wisdom and insight, that we spend half of our time crying out for good leaders to step forward but then when they do we spend the other half of our time crucifying them and it's not just church and you know just just imagine the process of stepping up and uh, running for president and we're 
one of the first things you have to think about. Do I want to put my family through this? Because it's horrible. But we need leaders. We do need leaders. Wherever people come together for a common purpose, in order to get anything done, organization is needed. Any gathering together of people that is leaderless is simply just a, a mob, a chaos, and nothing good is going to happen out of that. And so just think, just think a moment to make my point. What life would be like in our society if there were no police, no local government, or state borders, or lawmakers, or schools, or road builders? or banks, or money, or hospitals. All of these things exist because of leaders. If all this went away, I guarantee you, in just a few months, most people would be dead. And even the ones with guns. I spent uh, some time in a church where, where there was lots of suspicion about government. There was a lot of people buying guns and just trying to prepare for chaos, you know, and the breakdown of government. And uh, I came to the conclusion that it wouldn't take very long for a mob that confronted someone with a gun to sneak up and throw a, throw a, a Molotov cocktail through a window and your guns wouldn't help you at all. It wouldn't be very long before the ones who survived would be living in the Stone Age. Imagine how your own body would function if all organization were removed. I sat back and, and uh, kind of observed that we have a skeletal system, a muscle system, a nervous system, a respiratory system, an immune system, a circulatory system, a digestive system, and there's a lot of other systems that I have left unnamed, and if you take all those systems away, a body ceases to function. So the, the New Testament tells us that a local church is like a body, and just like our physical bodies, with no organization or leadership, it cannot function either. And so as we look at the New Testament, we see that the church was given a particular structure so that it would be able to accomplish some tasks and get things done. And so we're going to look at how that unfolds this morning. I'd like you to go to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. To start out, I one of the difficult things about this topic is when we start out, we discover that there's a wild card thrown in right off the bat that makes it a little hard to sort out. And the wild card is the apostles. So we meet the apostles. The apostles are essentially the 12 disciples minus Judas. And then we would discover that uh, in order to get their complement of apostles up to 12 again, that there's this discussion in Acts chapter 1. I'd like to read it this morning, starting in verse 21. So there, but prior to this, Peter is just making the observation that Judas is uh, not there anymore. He died. He betrayed the Lord. So in verse 21, he says, Therefore it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us, for one of these, so he's giving a job description of an apostle here, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they, here's a, uh, they uh, have some nominations and so on, and so... So of verse 25, it says, To take over this apostolic ministry which Judas left to go where he belongs. And so these men, these 12 men, were men who were with Jesus during his earthly ministry and who were able to stand up and say, I am an eyewitness of the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I saw him. So we learn in the Gospels that Jesus appointed 12 of these men 
and that he taught them how to do ministry. So he sends them out two by two and they get all kinds of sort of hands-on ministry experience and it's very clear um, that Jesus is training the twelve to carry on the work after he leaves. And so they did that. They provided spiritual leadership and uh, after he left in the book of Acts, they, they step in and handle difficulties whenever they pop up. There's two problems built into this system. And I'm not, this isn't a critical of the Lord Jesus or anything, but there's two difficulties with this system of the apostles. And they're just AFCPS. Any fool could plainly see we're going to have problems with this way of doing business. Number one, these guys are mortal. They're going to die. Right? They're just men, just like you and I. And they have a lifespan. And many of them weren't spring chickens when they started. And so there's going to come this time when the apostles are gone. And the other huge problem we're going to see in just a moment is that the church is going to grow to the place where we need more than 12 guys. Imagine that there were 12 apostles trying to do everything, lead the church today. You'd say, man, I wish an apostle would show up here because we've got questions and we've got issues and problems to solve, but you know, you get like one apostle per continent. So that, you know, the church is going to grow. We need more than 12. Now, now the, the mortality, the fact that the apostles were going to die, that was partially solved. And I want to just sort of go on a little rabbit trail this morning that I hope will uh, be a blessing to you. I'd like you to take your fingers and put one finger at the gap between the Old and New Testament at Matthew chapter 1, and then all the way back to the end of the book of Revelation. The 27 books in our New Testament were written by the apostles, either by them or by men who had an apostle standing behind him looking over his shoulder. Mark, for example. The Gospel of Mark was written by Mark, but Peter is really the guy that's providing the eyewitnesses, and, and Mark is pretty much writing down what Peter tells him to. Luke is the same thing. Luke worked with Paul, and so on. And so, Jesus gave the apostles the ability to speak authoritative truth during their lifetime, and as their ministry unfolded, and as they wrote, what they did is they left behind 27 documents that now make up our New Testament that is, is, not was, is the apostolic witness to the ministry of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So in a sense, the apostles left behind the New Testament to take the place for their actual physical presence. So this is where the authority for our, the existence of our church comes from. I'd like us to look here at Ephesians 2.20. I have it on the screen for you. This is Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. Look at what he says here. This is amazing. He's talking about the church and he calls it God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Jesus Christ as its chief cornerstone. So it's probable that John the apostle made it to Ephesus, but I'm, no apostle came to heart. Did you see an apostle? That no apostle came here to establish the church, but what did come here to heart was something that the apostles wrote the New Testament together with the, the prophets, it's the Old Testament the cornerstone Jesus Christ, he came here in the presence of the, in the person of the Holy Spirit and so the existence of this particular local church is here and the foundation of this church just like every true New Testament church who is preaching the gospel and is living under the authority of the of the word of God can be said to be built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets that makes sense to you this this is the the wonder of the written word of God it is just you know, the hair standing up on the back of my arm just the, the that the apostles are gone 
but what they saw and what they heard lives on in the New Testament. Just, just for a, a fun experience, gather around the table this afternoon and read the first six verses of 1 John chapter 1. And John talks about this word that we saw with our eyes and we heard with our ears and we touched with our hands. So that, that is woven all the way through the New Testament. Now I want to make the observation this morning that, that this issue forms the crux that has divided all Christendom right down the middle. Christendom. Half of Christendom says that Peter was the leader of the apostles and that his power to speak for God with authority was passed down from generation to generation so that even today there is a man living in Italy whose words carry equal weight to, the, to the, what the apostles wrote in the New Testament. He's even called an apostle. Okay? I disagree with that. The other half of Christendom says, and I am one of them, they say that the apostles were eyewitnesses to Christ's resurrection and were personally acquainted with his ministry. They heard what he said with their own ears, and the apostles died, but their words are left to us in the New Testament. And that the, in the New Testament, that's where the authority is. That is why I'm not supposed to be up here telling you what I think. I'm supposed to be up here telling you what the apostles said. And I have no personal authority to... That, that my opinion doesn't about things doesn't matter any more than anybody else's opinion. That it's the, the statements made from front and center here that are based on the clear teaching of... of of the Old and New Testament, that's where the authority comes from. It doesn't seem like a big thing, perhaps, as you're sitting there, but this is a huge issue. Huge issue. How do we know what God says? The answer to that question uh, is there's hardly anyone a question more important. So in the early church that sprouted up in Jerusalem, everything happened under the leadership of the apostles with Peter as their leader. So they made all the decisions and they're just kind of doing all the preaching and whatever happened, it started with them. So we get to a problem over in Acts chapter 6. So turn there with me. The church is growing. Thousands of people are being saved. That's the, they're an educated guest puts the number of believers in Jerusalem by the time we get to Acts 6 at 20,000. 20,000. So it turns out that one of the things that was sort of being lost in the shuffle, mishandled, was the, was the whole question of benevolence uh, to widows. We just took a benevolent offering this morning and the early church did the same kind of thing. And, and there were uh, no social uh, nets underneath. The, you know, if, if a woman was going to have uh, food on her table, and if she was a widow, somebody was going to have to help her. There was no welfare, food stamps, all those things. And so the church stepped up and met that need. But one of the problems was that the, the Jewish, the Hebrew, uh, the natives to Israel, those widows were kind of being taken care of. And the ones that spoke Greek were being neglected. There's a little bit of a hint here of uh, sort of a, a class warfare within the church of the Greek speaking with uh, Jewish Christians and the uh, Hebrew speaking Christians. And so the whole thing turned into a big controversy. There's complaining, you know, you can read it for yourself here in the first few verses of Acts chapter 6. And so the apostles step forward, so, you know, they reckon, oh, we do have a problem. It's a really a problem generated because so many people are... We've got 20,000 believers running around here and 12 men in, responsible to meet all these needs and we just... There's not enough hours of the day to do all this. And so what they did is they chose seven men to take care of this need 
and you'll notice here that they said in verse 2 they said it would not be right to for us apostles to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables and so there's this hierarchy of need if you can call it there's kind of the spiritual needs there's the teaching and preaching and witnessing and doing a hard thinking about what this this new Christianity means and uh, leading the church and you can just imagine without a New Testament to refer to how many issues would come up for the we don't know what to do and so these guys are just working uh, all day all night and so the the, the food problem uh, crept uh, up and uh, caught them by surprise and so they chose these seven men that they called them diakenos and it means to wait on someone at table just like if you go to a restaurant or if you had a lived in a English manor or something and there's a butler with a towel hanging over his arm and he comes and serves you at your table the Jerusalem church just called these men the seven the seven later the men who served similar roles in other churches were called deacons what I want us to understand this morning is that these men came into being to form the perform the ordinary business of running the church while the apostles provided the spiritual leadership so let's move on Jesus really never gave the church a handbook that addressed all the answers to all these issues and questions the book of Acts isn't so much an instruction manual as much as it is a record of what people actually did as they made decisions on the fly. And so in these days, the apostles were going farther and farther afield. Remember Jesus over in Acts chapter 1 says, you're going to be witnesses in Jerusalem, and then in the nearby region, Judea, and then Samaria, that's sort of the like county next to the north, and he says ultimately the uttermost parts of the earth. I'm commissioning you to bring the gospel and so they started doing that Thomas we know went to India and led many people to Christ in India Andrew went to Turkey and uh, sort of the underbelly of the Soviet old Soviet Union Ukraine Philip went to North Africa James remember John and James were brothers James we find out in Acts chapter 12 he was martyred Herod killed James and so the, the numbers of the apostles is sort of getting smaller and they're out doing ministry. They're not home. They're not in Jerusalem. And so now what do we do for leadership in the church? There's a couple apostles hanging around yet, but there's most of those guys are gone. And so the church needed some more leaders to come online and, and uh, certainly eyewitnesses of Christ were in shorter and shorter supply as the years rolled on. And so what they did is they raised up a new category of leaders and they called them elders. Look in Acts chapter 11 for the first mention of elders. Chap verse 30, Acts 11:30, the last verse. It's the sort of sort of mentioned um, offhandedly Paul during his uh, missionary journeys uh, uh, gathered up some uh, well Paul's not the church and uh, provided some help for the uh, church in Jerusalem uh, they were going through a time of famine so it says they sent their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul so elders are really let's talk about where the name came from you can go all the way back and in, uh, in Exodus, it talks about the elders of Egypt. Um, the elders of Israel are, are refer, referred to often. Um, the elders were simply men that were given the responsibility of the leadership in whatever group we're talking about. In the Jewish religion, they had elders. If you look up the word elders in a concordance, Jesus is running into the elders all the time. The Pharisees and the elders of the Jews sometimes would come and have hard things to say to Jesus so it's only natural for the church to call their leaders elders as well these are simply men who are providing leadership for the church 
So now let's go to Acts chapter 14. Paul and Barnabas are on their first missionary journey. And you'll notice that when we get to verse 23 of chapter 14, that they're, they're in one of these towns where they were starting churches. And it says that they appointed elders. It says, Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them, that's in their church, in each church, and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. So someone says, well, hey, where are the deacons? Well, I, I think that uh, we've observed the principle, here it doesn't say where the deacons were, uh, that what the church needs first is elders. And when, when the church grows and the number of believers are such that, that it's, uh, the elders are becoming distracted by, by uh, all the, the needs and the benevolent needs and whatever else needs comes up and they're finding themselves under pressure and they're doing less praying and less teaching and they're just sort of doing the business of running the church, that's when you need deacons. And so the first officers that were appointed in the church seems to be elders and then later on when the need arises the deacons come along. In Acts chapter 15 something very fascinating unfolds. Paul and Barnabas have returned from their first missionary journey to their home church at Antioch. Antioch was a couple hundred miles north of Jerusalem in Syria. And while they were in Antioch, some well-meaning men from Jerusalem visited Antioch and advised the believers in Antioch. Now here's Jewish Christians coming from Jerusalem north to Antioch. And what they're saying is that in order to become a Christian, you have to become a Jew first. Of course, all these Gentiles are going, whoa, what are you, what, what's this? That's, that's a new teaching. We haven't heard that before. And so Paul and Barnabas were there, and they, they tried to hash this out. And uh, they had this argument that talks about it in, the, in um, verse 1 and 2 of Acts chapter 15. And so they, they couldn't resolve the problem. And so it says in the second half of verse 2 that Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. And so here's... Here's a mention now for the first time in the book of Acts that we have kind of a leadership team in operation in Jerusalem where we've got the apostles, some of them, and then we've got elders and, and the elders are kind of alongside the apostles to help provide leadership. And so they have this debate and so Acts 15, we church historians know that in Acts 15 we have the record of the first church council where where uh, men come together to consider uh, a basic question about Christian doctrine and figure out what the will of the Lord is. So the church by now has been in existence for about 20 years and we have these apostles and elders working together. So in verse 6 they all meet to consider this question and so Peter is the first one who stands up and speaks. So who is Peter? Well Peter is the leader of the apostles. And he's also been the one that's been kind of bringing the gospel to Jews. And so he stands up and he talks about uh, some things that he knows and has experienced and so on. He goes back and refers to the salvation of uh, Cornelius, a Roman, and uh, talks about, well, it's obvious that Gentiles are, you know, part of God's plan for the church. And so he says his piece and he sits down. And then in verse 11, Paul stands up. Or verse 12, excuse me. Um, and so Paul and Barnabas stand up and they've just come back from their first missionary journey and, and the people that have been, they've been talking to are Gentiles. Some Jews, but a whole lot of Gentiles. And so they say what they think. And then it says in verse 13, when they finished, James stood up. Brothers, listen to me. And you go, whoa, James, who's that? Well, who is that? There's lots of Jameses in the New Testament. It's not James, the brother of John. He's an apostle, but he died. He was martyred in Acts chapter 12. This is James, the half-brother of Jesus. This James here wrote the book of James. It's at the tail end of our New Testament. 
And as you begin to read, it looks for all the world like the authority here is James. James is running this meeting. And so he sort of summarizes what's been said, and he's talking about, he refers to the prophets, he's quoting, and he, he sort of makes this proposal, what the church should do, and uh, suggests a letter be written. And so James is is uh, leading the Jerusalem church. No doubt he consulted with Peter on occasion. But Peter is an old man. James is still serving as an elder nine years later. We read about it in Acts chapter 21, verse 18. By the time we get to Acts chapter 21, there are no apostles serving in Jerusalem. They're either dead or they're out doing ministry. By this time, Peter is in Rome. Now, he was in Jerusalem in Acts 15, but by the time we get to Acts 21, almost 10 years later, Peter's in Rome. And so the only people left to provide leadership for the church in Jerusalem are the elders. And we uh, see in verse 20, uh, verse 18 of 21 of Acts, it says, When we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers greeted us formally. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James, and all the elders were present. So when you think about this, this just makes a lot of sense adding elders to take the place of the apostles. The apostles are a dying breed. There's only so many of them and, and you can't mint any more because they're eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the, the church needs leaders and the apostles aren't it. So as I began to look at this, I just was sort of hunting around in my New Testament for some, some other verses that just helped me to paint this picture a little more clearly. I observed that Paul writes two letters to Timothy and one to Titus to help them set up local churches. And he talks about elders and deacons. Be these being the two offices of the church. And as we already said, elders were chosen first and then as the church grew, deacons appear to have been added to relieve the elders of the burden of this day-to-day -day operations so that uh, all the details get covered. Deacons are not even mentioned by name in the book of Acts. We have these servers, table waiters in Acts 6, but they're not mentioned in Acts, probably because we're dealing with baby churches. In Iconium and Lystra and Philippi and Corinth and just all the different Thessalonica, Berea, all the places where the apostles went and started churches. No mention of deacons. One church where we know they had both offices was the church at Philippi in his opening greeting in Philippians chapter 1. This is the only place in the New Testament where you find this. Paul greets the saints in Philippi and he says, there on the screen, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and the deacons. And overseers is a synonym for elders. It's sort of a, a word referring to elders that more describes what they do instead of what they're called. I'll show you later that overseers and elders are the same people in another message. I judge from this that the church in Philippi was a thriving church that needed to have deacons because they were growing. And uh, the elders couldn't cover all the bases. So what I learned this week as I studied was that the leadership structure of the very early church was influenced by the presence of the apostles. There are, there are churches today where you can go into the church and the pastor or the leadership team, they're called apostles. If you, if you find a place like that, run for your life run for your life because they're going to start making statements that have equal weight to the scriptures I've run in I've run into men in my ministry like that in the very beginning the apostles were the church leadership they were it but very soon the church needed help more men to come online for lots of reasons first because 
there were lots of new believers. The deacons were the first office to be uh, called into being. They were called to wait on tables while the apostles performed the more spiritual tasks of teaching, praying, defending the faith, and providing spiritual direction for the church. And then as the apostles died or went off on their uh, missionary journeys, the, the men called to uh, take their place as leaders in the church were called elders. The elders are mentioned 21 times in the New Testament and deacons are mentioned by name four times in the New Testament. Five times if you count Acts 6 where they're actually not named. Along the way I have gained a much greater appreciation for the authoritative place that, the, that our Bible has in the life of the church. So what we want to go do in the two messages I have left is answer these questions. What did these people do? How were they selected? What were their qualifications? How was the church to respond to them? What is the difference between elders and deacons? How did women fit into the picture? And where are the people that we call pastors in all of this? I'm kind of personally attached to that last question. Um, and you'd be surprised how little mention there is of, of that particular uh, job description. So we've got a couple weeks to see if we can get to the bottom of this. I'd like to have our um, gentleman come forward now. One of the apostles that we're most familiar with is the Apostle Paul. He had a hard time convincing people that he was an apostle. A lot of people said, well, you're not a real apostle. And he said, well, I have. I am an eyewitness to the resurrection of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he refers to the, the confrontation that he had with Jesus on the road to Damascus on the day that he was saved. Um, so he has something to say to the church about the Lord's table in Acts chapter 11. He says, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. And so he, what he's saying is Jesus personally taught me and I am now as one of his apostles handing what he said over to you. And because he wrote it down, we're not talking about hundreds of handoffs here we're talking about two handoffs, what Jesus said to Paul and what Paul wrote down. It's all this nonsense about oh, how many thousands of years and the truth has been lost and all that. No. Jesus said to Paul, Paul's telling us, and there it is for us to read. And what he says is that is that on the day that Jesus the night before Jesus died, he instituted a memorial, something to use, a device with which to remember what it was that he did. And, and uh, what he did was to die on the cross for our sins. And the church must not forget. And so that's why we do this regularly, to keep the main thing the main thing. So we hold on to the bread and we hold it in our hands and we, and we say, the Spirit, uh, God who is a Spirit became a man and he took on a body of flesh and he allowed himself to be broken for us. And it's in him that I put my faith. And if that's where you are spiritually, then we invite you to join us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you have given to us. We pray your blessing as we partake together.
Paul says, The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we are holding in our hands in just a moment a memorial to the blood that was shed for us. Lord, we confess that there is nothing that we could do in our own energy to earn your good graces and favor because we are sinners. And uh, there's, we don't have the merit all merit, all perfection, all goodness to the Lord Jesus, though. And thank you that he, on our behalf, satisfied the justice of God, your justice, and for that we are forever grateful. Thank you for being so merciful. Covenant means a way of doing business like 
much like contract. I'm going to operate differently. It's going to be through my blood now, Jesus says. He says, because of this, do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we thank you for the witness of the apostles and for you putting it down in writing so that we can know these things for certain. We love you. Thank you for the provision you've made for us. We pray with thankfulness.